Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Sue. I'm a very grateful member of Al-Anon today because I love an alcoholic. Hi. Thank you. I want to thank Christine and the committee and uh, the people that are responsible for asking Keith and I to come and share at this convention. It's always neat to come back to Texas. I hear things here that I don't hear in California, like <laughs> like some of the things Billy was saying. <laughs> and uh, and it just it brings me back home. It makes me feel comfortable. Yeah, it's neat to see all these people coming in this room because I knew all those people out there in the hallway that were so sick were not all al- alkies. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I uh, I enjoy my life today. Yeah, you know, and uh, Billy was talking about newcomers. I enjoy newcomers today. You know, they light up my life. Yeah, you know, and I enjoy alcoholics today, and that's new. You know, alcoholics are my entertainment. Yeah, you know, and there's some in here. I can feel them. Yeah, you, know, you uh, an alcoholic walks into a room and something happens, good or bad. Something's always going to happen. I like that excitement, that unpredictability. Yeah, you know, it's wonderful. It's like this Al-Anon that went to the doctor for some tests, and he finally called her back in for the results of her test. He said, I have some bad news for you, and I have some advice. And she said, well, let me hear it. And he said, you have terminal cancer, and you have six months to live. And she said, oh, my gosh. What's the advice? He said, marry an alcoholic. It'll seem like an eternity. <laughs> So, I love having fun. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and I hear a lot of alcoholics poking fun at Al Anon, you know, and I, I like to get even still. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here because I'm not all there. I'm not well yet, you know. And I'm glad because I see a lot of people around here get well and then they aren't, you don't see them anymore. So I'm glad I haven't gotten well. Now, I need this program just as much today, if not more, than I did when I got here because I have a lot more awarenesses today of what I'm like and who I am. And Christine and I was talking about it earlier, you know, and I believe that it's the newcomers that keep me coming back, that keep me looking backwards and that keep me aware of where I came from so I don't forget who I am today. And I'm grateful for the newcomers. I hope there's some newcomers. Is there anyone in here in Al-Anon for the first 30 days in the program? Raise your hand. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm here for you and me today. Now, I get to come and uh, let my higher power use me as an instrument to carry the words to the newcomers that that newcomer and I need to hear. And that's the only purpose I have here today. And I'm glad all of you are here to support me and to love on me because I need a lot of love. And uh, I enjoyed Billy sharing a lot. I identified with it a lot. Um, I think the only difference between an al and an al and an alcoholic is the obsession Theirs is the booze and ours is the boozer, you know, and that's the only difference. I used to think as much all day long of how much he was going to drink and where he was and all the things he was doing just as much, I believe, as he was thinking about getting a drink. And I was just as obsessed with his drinking as he was. And I believe that that's what uh, what got me here today. You know, I had to go through everything I had to go through in order to get here right now because this program teaches us to live in the right now. And uh, I wasn't always that way. I didn't come from an alcoholic home, so I can't blame anybody for who I am or the way I am. I believe that my God gave me a certain amount of characteristics. And when I met the disease of alcoholism, my characteristics turned in character defects. I don't blame that alcoholic for who I am or the way I turned out because, you see, I have choices. I don't believe there's any victims in this room. I think there's only volunteers. Yeah, and uh, and that's the way it is for me. You know, nobody held a gun to my head and said you got to go with him. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, oh, it happened a lot later. <laughs> and you'll hear about that. <laughs> it's uh, 
I like Texas so well because I was raised in the Texas Oklahoma panhandle and uh my my dad worked in the oil fields and we lived in a trailer house and we moved around a lot. And I never felt like I belonged anywhere because I'd go to school two or three different schools in the same school year, so I never felt like I belonged in the and I was always called oil fields trash, so I always felt less than. Yeah, you know, and being in the Texas Houston area, I know there's a lot of you guys in here too, so I feel right at home. <laughs> you know. It's like uh it doesn't matter who we are, or where we come from, you know, we all end up where we need to be. And uh the images aren't there anymore. Yeah, you know, we're all just God's kids, you know, and that's the way it is. It um uh, when I was growing up I had an older sister and a younger brother and I always wanted to be number one. I would block those people out of my mind, like when we'd get in the car to go somewhere, I'd sit in the front seat with my mother and father, and, and I'd call us the three musketeers, totally denying that my sister and brother were there, because I always wanted to be up front. I wanted to be number one, I wanted to be up front, and uh, I'd do anything I had to do to feel that way, because I never had those feelings. It's like I always looked at you, and I wanted to feel like you looked. I always judged your outsides with my insides. And I always thought if I looked like you, I could feel like you. And so I had to do things to push myself up front so I could feel like I was somebody because I never felt like anybody. And uh, I went through school that way. When I was in the sixth grade, we moved to a little town in the Panhandle, Perryton, and we settled down there. And I always wanted to be a hometown girl, and I never felt like a hometown girl. And I'd do the things that uh, my girlfriends did. I had to run around with the in crowd. You know, and do the things that they were doing, but I never felt part of. And uh, and I went through school that way. And uh, when I was 16, my father passed away with cancer, and it was like uh, I immediately changed places with my mother. I became the responsible one because after a certain period of time, she started dating and going out and having fun. And I was the one standing at the door when she'd come home and say, where have you been? And... Uh, so I became the responsible one in that family, and uh, and I didn't uh, feel the attention that I wanted. And all of this is hindsight. I didn't know it was what I was feeling then. I felt lonely, unwanted, unloved, and alone. And because uh, my mom was doing her own thing, I started looking for love in all the wrong places, and I ended up in San Antonio in an unwed mother's home, and I gave a child up for adoption. I'm not proud of the things that I did, but I know it's part of what got me here because I had to experience every bit of pain that I had to experience in order to get here. And uh, when I got back from that home, I no longer felt one more time like I fit in. And I uh, started running around then with my, my mom and her friends because they were fun. My girlfriends were immature then. And uh, so I started going to things like honky-tonks and rodeo dances with them. And God, I loved it. Now, those honky-tonks are wonderful. And I got to go to a rodeo dance with my mom and her friends in Guyman, Oklahoma. And uh, we got up there, and, and I stood around that big Quonset hut, and I watched this cowboy go around the room. And God, everywhere he went, something was happening, and I thought it was wonderful. It was usually a fight, but I thought it was wonderful. <laughs> and uh, so I watched him, and uh, pretty soon a fight broke out. He came running past me, and he said, Honey, tell me when the cops leave, you know. So uh, I stood on duty like a good potential al -Anon. I was given direction. <laughs> he ran in the women's restroom to hide. And so when the fight was over and the cops left, I told him, I said, You can come out now, cowboy. And when he came out, he asked me for the last dance. And you guys, I know, have been to those last dances. They're pretty slow where you can rub up against each other and get ready to go home. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And this one was a fast dance, and it just kept getting faster and faster and faster, and we never missed a lick, and I loved it. It was wonderful, because what I understand about that today is that, you know, I wanted to be up front and somebody, and I wanted in the fast lane. I didn't know how to do that. I used an alcoholic, because what I understand today is that he drank booze. And booze got him up front, got him in the fast lane, and made him somebody. And I hooked onto him, and alcohol did for him and I what we couldn't do for ourselves. And I used an alcoholic to, to lock that thing and those feelings to happen inside of me. And I understand today. I used and abused other people to get my way. You know, and he did for me exactly what I couldn't do for myself because booze did for him what he couldn't do for himself. And so that's why I understand today that I'm powerless over alcohol. 
you know, that that step applies to me, that the Al-Anon program works the same exact 12 steps as Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous for sharing their program and their steps with us. I'm a big book Al-Anon because I believe that's where it came from, and I want the original one. I deserve the best. And uh, that's why I have my program is designed exactly the way the Al-Anon book and the AA book suggest in no other way because I want it all, and I want it right. Because, you see, I identify with Billy of being perfect, you know. I believe there's ways that we can turn those character defects into assets, you know, and we can get the best of life. And uh, I started going with that alcoholic, and uh, he wasn't an alcoholic then. He was just a drunk. I didn't know that. My mom said I couldn't go with him because I'd been in trouble, and I couldn't date guys older than I was supposed to. And uh, she told me, she said, he's older than you, he's in trouble all the time, and he's been married before. And I said, I don't care. And we were having that fight from the point that he called me for a date until he rang the doorbell. And he opened the door, he rang the doorbell and opened the door and let him in and introduced him to my mom. And then we started to go out and have our date. We walked outside, and there's no car. And I said, uh, what are, what are we going to do? How are we going to go? And he said, well, I don't have a car and I don't have a driver's license, but you do. And I said, you're right. You know, no problem. So, uh, <laughs> so I put him in my car and, and I took him to the drive-in movie where I always went with dates and I knew what to do. You know, you used to kiss and smooch and steam up the windows. And I got that drive-in movie with Keith and we watched the movie. And I thought, you know, this must be what it's like to be with a more mature man. Yeah. And I was really impressed by that. Looking back over that, I understand, you know, he had a six-pack of beer between his legs. He was more interested in than me. And uh, I remember sitting there and thinking, just like our ally on literature talks about, you know, what's wrong with me? Aren't I pretty enough? Aren't I smart enough? You know, I understand today that I started competing with alcohol on the very first date because that's what I'm about and that's who I am. I wanted to be number one in that man's life. The only way I know how to do it is to compete. And I've got to put things down, whether it's people, places, and things around me in order to make me feel good. And I started doing that from the very beginning, proving my right to be right, knowing that I knew all things and trying to change somebody else's mind to think that they thought like I thought. And if you followed that, you're in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> So we uh, he, we started dating on a regular basis, and uh, he'd get drunk and he'd stand me up, and I'd get angry. I'd get that knot in my gut that I know all of you have had, and I'd be mad, and I'd think he's got to know how that feels. So when he'd call me to ask me out again, then I'd I'd hurry and I'd try to chug a lug a few beers so I'd be drunk when he got there so he'd know how it felt. And he'd get there to pick me up, and he'd look at me, and he'd go, you're not going. And I'd say, well, why not? I go with you when you're drunk. And he'd say, I know, you hang out with drunks. I don't. (laughs) And he was right. He was right, yeah. So... And that's the way we started dating. We'd fight about those kind of things. Yeah, and we'd have all kinds of crazy fights. And uh, the first Christmas we dated... We went to Liberal, Kansas, across the Oklahoma panhandle, and we got in a fight up there, and Keith was drunk, and we started back across the Oklahoma line. He didn't have a driver's license. He had stole his grandparents' car, and uh, we we started back across the Oklahoma line, and there was radar set up there. And uh, he said, my God, if they catch me, I'll never see the sun again. And I said, no problem. So we switched places in that car going 100 miles an hour. But there's nothing wrong with me yet. And uh, <laughs> and they had roadblocks set up for us at the other end of the line. And when they stopped, they told me, they said, we don't know how you got under the wheel the way you did, but we know he was driving, so we're going to have to arrest both of you because you're under the wheel. And we, we clocked you. And... Uh, they checked out the car and found out that it had been reported stolen, and Keith smarted off to him. And they handcuffed him and put him in the sheriff's car and told me to follow him 40 miles to the county seat so I could be arrested. <laughs> and uh, like a good potential al I was given a direction one more time, and I followed direction. And, uh, and I drove there so they could arrest me. And... Uh, 
<laughs> they did, and we're standing there in jail, and I'll never forget it. Uh, they said, you can make one phone call. And Keith said, I want to speak to the district attorney. <laughs> and I thought, my God, this man goes straight to the top. You know? <laughs> and I was so impressed with that, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so pretty soon this man came in, and he had on an old winter coat with a fur collar on it and gray mature hair, and... And I was immediately attracted to him, and today I know it's because he's alcoholic also. And uh, <laughs> Keith introduced me, and he said, Sue, this is my father. So the first Christmas we dated, I was in custody to my future father-in-law, but there wasn't anything wrong with me. Yeah. And we kept dating, and uh, after we dated for about two years, um, Uncle Sam sent him a letter. And we decided we couldn't live without each other, so we ran off and got married. And then the next weekend, he went to take his physical, and Uncle Sam didn't want him, so I got to keep him. And uh, <laughs> shortly after that, his grandparents and I decided that what he really needed to do was to finish school. And he'd been going to school for about eight years and never gotten a degree. And then when I decided that I had what it took to make him stay. And so we moved to Stillwater, Oklahoma, and Keith enrolled in school one more time. Shortly after we moved there, uh, we had a little girl. And I can remember being so grateful that she was a little girl because, you see, Keith was a drunk, his dad was a drunk, and his granddad was a town drunk. And I knew if we had had a boy, he would have carried on the drum tradition. I did not know that the disease of alcoholism has no prejudice, that it doesn't care if you're man, woman, what creed, color, race you are. It doesn't care. It doesn't even care if you drink booze. The disease of alcoholism will take you to the gates of insanity and hell. And that's the only thing left. And I didn't know that it always gets worse, that it never gets better. And I'm a hanger in there, you know. And in an Al-Anon meeting, I feel comfortable because I know I'm here with a lot of hanger in there, you know. And that you guys don't think that I'm, uh, that I'm wrong for hanging in. A lady asked me one time, she goes, why did you live through all that? Why did you stay so long? And I thought, God, you haven't taken the second step if you got to ask me that, you know, <laughs> because it's the insanity that takes us down the road to get us to where we got to be today. And uh, so after we lived there for a while and Keith finished school, it like, took him four years to only get a two-year degree, but we got it. And I took all the credit for it because, you see, he couldn't have done it without me. And he came home one day and he said, Sue, you don't have to go to these honky-tonk dances anymore. You don't have to drink out of paper sacks anymore. We're going to move to California because that's where a lady like you needs to be. And got to use those magic words. I always wanted to be a lady. You know, and it's like he was right. You know? And I didn't want to move to California at all, but if that's the only place you could be a lady, then I was ready to go. <laughs> And so we packed up, and, and we went from Stillwater to Oklahoma City. And we had to stop there at midnight to get a prescription filled in a baggie. And I did not think that was wrong. And uh, we started our trip to California. Now, Keith had built this great big, huge box to pull behind our station wagon. And he painted it bright blue, you know, so we, nobody would notice us, I guess. And... Uh, <laughs> We looked like the grapes of wrath going out there. Uh, we had a Siamese cat and a German shepherd dog and Simone and him and I in that station wagon. And uh, we made that trip in 30 days. It should have taken us three, but we got to make it in 30. <laughs> because it depended on what he took and what he drank as to how far we went. And there was days we just stayed put. You know, and uh, I didn't know I had choices. It's like we'd get up in the morning and it was like, how do you feel? You know, and it depended on how he feel, felt as to what we did. You know, and uh, we did that for 30 days, and it was just insanity at the end of that time. Our German shepherd got where he would stand behind the driver's seat in that station wagon and wait on big trucks and chase them to the back of the car barking. <laughs> and uh, he'd run over the cat while he, when he'd run back, and there'd be a dog and cat fight. And then they'd step on Simone, and Simone would start crying, and then I'd start bitching, and Keith would start drinking. And we did that for 30 days. You know. And... Uh, and it was crazy, and we finally, we got there, and Keith went to work, and uh, and I, would, I decided not to work and to stay home and be a mother, and Simone wouldn't play with me. She didn't like me. She kept saying, I want to go to a babysitter, and, uh, and it, so it's like, what's wrong, you know? It's supposed to be wonderful, you know? 
And uh, Keith came home one night for work, and it was on a Friday night, and it set up a pattern for us that lasted for years. He said, would you like to go to dinner? And I said, God, yes. I thought he had never asked, you know, because that's where I, would go, where I was going to get to be a lady. Because he had told me that they serve cocktails in California. And I knew nobody could get drunk on cocktails because they mix them for you, you know. I didn't know they lim- did not limit you. And uh, we w- we got to go to that restaurant, and I loved it because when we drove up, it was a beautiful brick building that had a neon sign on it that said cocktails. You know, it wasn't painted on there. It wasn't carved in wood. It wasn't, wasn't all the things that I was used to. And people were dressed up in nice clothes, and they was walking in. And I remember the feelings of, my God, this is where I belong. I finally arrived. And we walked in that restaurant, and, God, I loved it. And one more time, it was like a fix for me. And I sit there, and I watch those people, and they were drinking out of these long stem crystal glasses. And living in a trailer house, I'd never had things like that. And that's what made people classy people, is the things that they had. And I watched those people, and they'd take those long stem glasses and swish them around. And got that wine and glisten in there. And then they'd sniff it, and I didn't know what in the hell they were sniffing for. But it looked, it looked cool, you know. And then they'd just sip on it. And I thought, God, that's wonderful. And so when they asked us if we wanted to order wine with our dinner, I said, yeah. Yeah, that's what we need to do. And uh, we'd had our cocktails before then, and we'd ordered Simone Shirley Temples. We didn't leave her out of our disease at all because, you see, alcoholism is a family disease, and everybody gets to participate in it. And, uh, and they brought us our wine, and God, they set those glasses down in front of us, and I was in seventh heaven. And they poured Keith just a little bit and asked him if it was okay, and I thought that was so dumb because he used to drink stuff that had things floating in it. <laughs> And I thought, what do, you, what do you mean, is it okay, you know? And then they poured mine, and God, I loved it, you know, and I'm such a copycat. And I sit there, and I swish my glass, and I sniffed it, and I tipped it up to sip it, and I was in seventh heaven until I looked across the table at Keith, and he's drinking out of the craft. <laughs> and I went, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm drinking. That's what I'm doing. And I said, not like that. And so I would say, oh, God, don't do that here. And she'd slide under the table, you know. And we'd start yelling at each other. And I'd say, now, look, everybody's looking at us. And he'd turn around, what are you looking at? You know? And then the waitress would say, come here. You know, bring us our food. And she'd say, you're not going to eat here. And we'd be 86 out of the restaurant. And all we did was just go there for dinner. And it's like, what happened? And we'd be walking out of that restaurant, and Keith's talking to everybody in sign language, and it's embarrassing. <laughs> it's, just, it's like, my God, what do they think of us, you know? I'm never going to be able to come back here again. And I was so embarrassed. And we'd get home, and I'd get right in Keith's face, and I'd say, don't you ever do that to us again. He'd say, Sue, get out of my face. And I'd take one step closer, and I'd say, if you ever do that to us again, you know, it'll be the last time you ever do it. He'd say, Sue, get out of my face or I'll hit you. And I'd take one step closer, and he'd hit me. And then the fight would be on, you know, and we'd have those knockdown, drag-out fights. And we'd be done with those fights. Keith would be done with me. And I always got the dirty end of the stick because he was a lot stronger than I was. And I'd have that rage and that anger in me, and I didn't know what to do with those feelings. And you see, because this is a family disease, that it goes downhill. And I'd turn around on Simone, and I'd take the rest of my anger out on her. And I remember one time hitting her head up against the wall. And she looked at me, and she goes, Mama, I know why you're doing that. You're doing that to show Daddy that you can act just like him. And I thought, how does she know? How does she know that? I didn't know that. You know, it's a family disease. We think our children don't know. You know, but we don't hide anything from them. You know, we started those kind of fights. You know, those fights were in our house on a regular basis. Because one night Keith had me on the bed and he had his hands around my throat and he was choking me to death and I just couldn't hardly breathe. I was about to die. 
And it dawned on me that there wasn't anything on his mind but me. I was number one. And I loved it. I was about to die, but I loved it. And so I started those kind of situations a lot because it's the only way I could get 100% of his attention. Yeah, and I didn't know then that's why I was doing it. But today I know it was negative attention, but it was all mine, and I didn't have to share it with anybody. And I wanted that attention any way I could get it. Because, you see, I didn't know I competed with this. And we started living like that, and Keith was always into guns. And we'd have our fights, and he'd pull his gun on me, and guns go off when you don't want them to. And it's scary. You know, and I think, my God, one of us is going to get killed. You know, we can't fight over guns like this anymore. So I quit fighting with him over guns. I started carrying a butcher knife. <laughs> because they do what you want them to. Yeah. And we started having our fights. One time, Keith put his gun right at the end of my nose. And he said, Sue, if you don't shut up, I'm going to shoot you. And I stuck my knife right in his stomach. And I said, you go first. And he went, you're crazy. (laughs) He said, if I shoot you, you're going to die. And I said, I know. But when you shoot me, the momentum will throw me backwards and the knife will go forwards. And we'll both die at the same time. So you choose who's going to go first. (laughs) Yeah. I still think that would work today. (laughs) And he'd be gone, and he'd come home, and it's like I was so afraid because I knew that we'd have one of those fights that I slept with my knife under the pillow, and I always stacked pans in front of the door, you know, because I didn't want him to sneak up on me because we had those kind of fights. Yeah, and we loved each other a lot, because when he'd get home, he'd lay his gun on the nightstand. He didn't trust me any more than I trusted him, Yeah, because we both were violent people. Today I know that all the words that came out of that man's mouth, that all the things that he said to me, I don't blame that man for those things, he said, because we have a pamphlet in Al-Anon called Attachment, and it talks about the disease that works through people. And today I understand that it was the disease working through that man, and it wasn't the man. But you see, the disease of alcoholism lived in me, too. And the disease wanted to hear those things that made me feel bad because the disease is negative. And it takes our life, and it takes us down. And it's the only direction it goes. And my disease wanted to hear those things, and I started believing them. And as I started believing those things, my self-worth went down. And the only feelings that I was able to feel were anger because I didn't know how to feel good anymore because the disease of alcoholism was taking over my (laughs) life and my feelings. And we'd have those fights and I'd have those angry feelings. And Keith would come home and he wouldn't want to listen to me anymore. And we'd go in the bedroom to finish our fights. And one night he passed out ten minutes into a two-hour conversation. My God, you just don't ignore an Al-Anon like that. (laughs) And it made me angry. And I took my knife, and I just started stabbing him 900,000 times all over his back, saying, God, please help me do this. Because, you see, I had no answers. I knew I didn't want to live this way anymore, but I didn't know what to do about it. And I'd say, God, please help me. And I think, my God, what has become of me? What am I doing? You know, and I laid there and I cried myself to sleep because I didn't know what to do. And the next morning, Keith woke up and he goes, my God, something is wrong with my back. (laughs) And he said, would you look at it? So I turned around and I had him turned around and I looked at his back and I said, I think you've broken out with acne of the back. (laughs) So I got the rubbing alcohol and I rubbed on it. And I loved it. Yeah. Every ooh and all. Ah, I mean, you talk about revenge. Yeah. And it was wonderful. Yeah. And I used to live for those kind of feelings of getting eaten. Yeah. And that's not a healthy way of life. Yeah. And, and I was listening to the gal this morning telling us how she shared this morning living in an alcoholic home. Yeah. I took all of my rage, my anger out on Simone, our daughter. Yeah, and she was saying this morning how her mom would say, you know, you're not getting in trouble. Yeah, you know, you're not getting a whipping. I'm going to jerk off your arm and beat you with the bloody end. Boy, I said that so many times, you know. I was so loving, you know. <laughs> and it's like, 
I didn't know I was affecting that child as much as the alcoholic was. I didn't know how to take responsibility for myself. It was his fault. I was always blaming him because, you see, he was the drunk. If he had only quit drinking, I would be okay. And I always called our parents and reported him to our parents in Texas and Oklahoma. It's like one time I called his stepmother. And she said, Sue, you're so young. You know, if you can't leave him, why don't you go to Al-Anon? And I said, I don't know what that is. And she said, it helps people that love drunks. And she said, call information. So I did. And they had a lady call me. And she said, honey, we can't help you. But if you'll go to, or we can't stop his drinking, but if you'll go to some meetings with me, we can help you. And I said, there's nothing wrong with me. She said, there might be one day. So why don't you take my phone number? And anytime you need help, you call me. And so I took her number down, and bless her heart. You now I've never met her in a meeting. And I don't know who she is, but she was there for me. And every time Keith would get on a real binge, I'd call her up and I'd say, he's doing it again. And I'd report him to her. <laughs> and she'd say the same thing over and over again. She'd say, honey, we can't help him, but if you will go to a meeting with me, we can help you. And I'd say, I don't need it. And one day she, Keith walked in and I was talking to him and it scared me to death. And I slammed down the phone, and he said, Who are you talking to? I said, I was talking to al and if you don't shape up, I'm going to call him again. <laughs> it's like, we were afraid of you. you know? <laughs> and Keith and I had a bad fight, and I'd fallen on the floor, and he'd kick the whole side of my face in. It was like I knew I couldn't live like that anymore. And I went to work, and I lied to him, and I told him all kinds of stories of why I look like that. And, uh, and then I went across the hall to a lawyer. And he said, my God, what happened to you? And I said, my husband and I had a fight. And he said, do you fight this way all the time? And I said, no, only when he drinks. He said, do you think he's an alcoholic? And I said, I don't know what one is. He said, it's somebody that can't stop drinking. And I said, then that must be what he is, because I've poured booze out, I've broken bottles, and I've done everything I can think of doing. He said, then if you love him, why don't you take him to a, a place called Alcoholics Anonymous? And I said, what is it? He said, it's a place where people go and it helps them stop drinking. And if you love him, why don't you take him there? And I said, okay, I will. And I went home that night and I told Keith that I'd been to a lawyer and he told me, if I love you, then I'll take you to Alcoholics Anonymous. And Keith said, honey, I knew it was going to come to this. <laughs> and he said, I called Alcoholics Anonymous today and a man came over and showed me where there's a meeting just a few blocks from here. Cunning, baffling, and powerful is the disease of alcoholism. I didn't know he was on a court card. I thought he was doing it for me. You know, if he loved me enough, he'd do it for me. And that's what I finally got to hear. And I said, okay. And he said, well, I said, when is it? And he said, there's one there tonight, and it starts at 8.30. And I said, okay. So I fixed dinner, and we had dinner, and Keith laid down on the couch, and Simone and I did the dishes, and I watched the clock. At 8 o'clock, I picked up my butcher knife, and I went over at the couch, and I said, get up. <laughs> And he said, what for? And I said, you're going to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, I don't think I want to now. I said, I believe you do. And I jabbed him. And he got up off that couch, and I drove him over at that AA meeting. <laughs> and we got over there, and I said, what time is it over? And he said, 10 o'clock. I said, okay, fat boy, you come out of that door for 10 o'clock, I'll gut you. <laughs> and I sat in that parking lot every Monday night for four months with my butcher knife, <laughs> keeping him sober. Now, the first thing I heard and I got talent on is that you can't keep a drunk sober. But I did for four months. <laughs> the sad part about that is there was an Alnon meeting in that church that very same night. But you see, there wasn't anything wrong with me yet. And I believe that we have to get to the want to. I believe that every Alnon has to hit a surrender just like an alcoholic does before we get to the want to and that we want the answers and we got to find a way of life for us. After I thought Keith had that down pat, I let him go by himself and AA hadn't taught him anything. He came home drunk. 
And the next four years of our life was total living hell because, you see, there were no answers. We lived in hell because we didn't know there was any other place to go. Because that's the only direction that the disease of alcoholism knows where to go. And it works through people. And it's ugly and it's negative. The fights and everything in our home got worse. The feelings started... I started stuffing my feelings because, you see, in a home like that, you can't share your feelings. Because when you share your feelings, they turn around like knives on you, and they turn and they hurt you because the disease of alcoholism starts telling that, that you're nobody, you're nothing, and you're stupid. And I started believing those things because, you see, my disease wanted me to believe it. Because, you see, my disease leads me to insanity or death. And I believe that my program is just as important to me as any alcoholic. Because, you see, I know where I came from and how crazy I was. And today my fears of going backwards are so much greater than what I have ahead of me because I know you're there for me. I know you're there to walk hand in hand with me. I don't have to go backwards only if I stay here. These, Because these are my only answers. And after living that way for four years... I came to a point in my life that I couldn't live that way anymore. I got to hit what I call my bottom, and I'm so grateful for that. Because, you see, my God loved me so much. He let me do everything that I had to do in order to get to you. He let me get to the want to. And I couldn't have found you any other way. And I remember the last drunk at our home, and I believe it's so important for me to remember that last drunk, or I might return to that kind of insanity. And that last drunk in our home, I remember seeing Keith over in the corner doing the things to Simone he'd always done to her. And I remember thinking, my God, he's not even a good father anymore. And I looked at Keith, and there was no yelling. Nobody was going around shutting the windows. Nobody was throwing knives or shooting guns. Nothing was happening in that house but just the calmness. And today I understand that I finally allowed my God to come back in my life because, you see, I'd rejected my God. He didn't pay attention to me because I'd ask him every day, God, please don't let this man drink today. And Keith got drunk every day. And I felt that my God had rejected me. I didn't know I was telling God what to do, not asking for help. And so I'd rejected my God. But that day I got to hit my surrender. And I looked at Keith and I said, Keith, I don't love you anymore, but I don't hate you either. And if you got to be a skid row bum, then that's what you got to do. But Simone, I ain't going to go any further with you. And we turned around and we walked out of that house for the very last time. And we stayed gone for about four days. And I don't even hardly remember what happened during that four days because, you see, I believe that al can operate in emotional blackouts. Because we block out the pain. And the only way that that thing has come back to me is through the writing of this program. And my God lets me remember things when I'm able to remember things and when I can stand the pain. Because, you see, he loves me. And we got to walk out of that house, and then after four days, we went back to get some things for Simone for school. And we walked in that house, and we were afraid. The fear that lived in that home, in that alcoholic home, was unreal. Because, you see, with guns and knives in a home like that, you know, there's things that happen that you have no control over because the disease of alcoholism lives there. Like one day we were sitting in the living room and Simona brought home a shaggy dog. And today I know Keith had been in the blackout. And he stood up in the living room and saw Simone loving on that little dog. And he said, you can't love that dog more than you do me. And he shot that dog in our living room. And that was the disease of alcoholism, the way it lived in our house. So there's fears in those homes. And we were afraid when we went back to that house because we didn't know if we'd find our animals dead, him dead, or what we'd find. So we walked up the house and we peeked in the window. And we was looking around in the w- through the window, and someone goes, there he is. God, we took out running, and I was in the car, and cleared out the end of the block, and I said, where? <laughs> <laughs> and she said he'd sit- been sitting in the jacuzzi with all of his guns and clips strapped on him, relaxing with a jug of booze. 
That's the way the disease lived in our home. So we waited till it got dark and we went back to that house. And we were afraid. And we walked in and we were very quiet and we was very cautious. And we walked into the bedroom and we saw Keith laying down on the floor and face down in that bedroom. God, we were scared. So we leaned over and we kicked him. <laughs> and he turned over. And I did the hardest thing it is, I believe, for an al to do to an alcoholic. I stood there and I remembered throwing out booze. I remembered busting bottles. I remembered through three and a half to four years earlier taking him to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I believed at that moment, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that I had done everything for an alcoholic that I was capable of doing. And I knew I had to do all those things right at that minute. Because, you see, I believe that's when I accepted the fact that I was powerless. And I looked at Keith, and I said to him, I said, No, I can't help you. If you want help, you get help for yourself. And today I understand that an alcoholic has to want to help themselves. They can't do it for anybody else or it won't work. And I'm so grateful that it happened like that in our lives. And after a while, Keith went to the phone and he made some phone calls. And we fought over again and again, you know, because that's the way it had to be for us. And it seemed like forever, and the doorbell rang, and I opened the door and there was a little gray-headed, shriveled-up man standing there, and I thought, Jesus Christ, why don't they send the big ones on these trips? <laughs> and a little gray-headed man came into our home, and I watched the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous happen in our home. And he asked me if I'd go with him to take Keith to a detox unit, and I did. And then he took me back home, and he sat there in the driveway, and he planted the seed. And he told me, he said, you know, you need help. You've been nothing but negative all night long. And he said, you're just as sick as the alcoholic. And I said, I believe he wants help this time. And he said, he can't do it without your support. And I said, no, you don't understand. I've heard all the promises. What makes you think that I'm going to believe him this time? And he said, don't you know that every time an alcoholic makes those promises, they mean them? But the disease of alcoholism doesn't, and the disease has control of the man, and he has no control of himself. And he said, I see something in Keith tonight that he wants this thing, and he can't do it by himself. He said, I've seen it happen many times, and today I can say I've seen it happen many times, that an alcoholic can't go home to an old idea and maintain his sobriety. He'll either end up drunk or he'll have to walk away. And I believe that support has to be lived in a house. I believe that the common path has to be walked toward the same goal of a higher power through these 12 steps in a home or it'll never work. The recovery has to be there because it's like talking foreign language to someone if you're not. And I don't want to speak a foreign language to my husband. Because, you see, I believe Al-Anon is designed to, to help families. I believe it's designed to help people love alcoholics. And that's the main purpose of this program. And if I love my husband, the only way I can show him my love is to support his sobriety. And the only way I know how to support that sobriety is to work a program for myself. And that's the way it has to be for me. And I started going to those meetings. And he had told Simone about the program called Alateen, and I have so much gratitude for Alateen. And Simone and I went to a couple of meetings, and they were okay. Yeah, but I wasn't that sick. And we got to go to into a counselor at the end of the 30 days Keith was in the hospital. And, and I stood in there and I yelled at her and told her how wonderful I was and I didn't really need this thing, you know. And she said, if you're so perfect, why are you standing here yelling at me? And it made me cry because nobody had ever made me look at me before. And she looked at Simone. She said, Simone, how do you feel about your father? And she said, I hate his guts. And I said, good, I'm glad you're hearing that sober with all my smug and arrogance. And she looked at Simone and she goes, Simone, how do you feel about your mother? And she said, I hate her guts. And I knew at that moment that I'd hurt that child just as much, if not more, than the alcoholic did. Because Dad drinks, but what's wrong with Mom? She just goes nuts. 
And so I knew I had to go to the program called Al-Anon. And I had to do it for me. Because, you see, I could no longer blame a drunk for the way I acted. And I got to take responsibility for me. And I started going to one meeting a week because I needed one meeting a week. He was going to a meeting every night, but then he's sicker than I am, you know? <laughs> and after about six weeks, he wasn't home when I thought he should. And I got angry. And I thought, damn him. You know, he's sober. He's not supposed to be staying out and doing these things now. And I thought, God, I can't be feeling that way. Because, you see, my sponsor had told me there are some days when all an alcoholic can do is not drink, and that's enough. And, you see, I didn't have any gratitude for that. And I started thinking, i got to remember some things I heard in those meetings. And so I, I fixed me a hot bath, and I thought, i got to sit here and think up some of those things that I've heard in those meetings. And I sit in that meeting, that bathtub, and I started feeling so good. Because I knew that he was at coffee with at least six alcoholics and he would have pole bears. <laughs> That's how well I was getting on one meeting a week. <laughs> and he came home and I was just as angry and my mouth was attached to the doorknob just like it had always been. And I got right in his face and he said, Sue, get out of my face. And I took one step closer. And he said, Sue, get out of my face. I'm not going to hit you anymore. My sobriety comes first. You're going to have to fix yourself. Oh, my God. <laughs> my fix wasn't working for me anymore. Well, how was I going to get my attention? How was I going to be number one? Now sobriety's number one. When am I going to be number one? God, I was devastated. And I turned around and I ran to the bathroom crying and screaming. And as I turned around and slammed the door, I saw a crazy lady in that bathroom, in the mirror. And, I, and the words came to me, and today I know it was my higher power talking to me. One meeting a week is not going to fix you. And today I know that's true in my life. My formula for recovery in here is that one meeting a week, I'm just taking up space that a newcomer needs to have that seat. That's all. I don't get anything on one meeting a week. It takes too long, and I want it now. Two meetings a week I can uncomfortably maintain, and three or more meetings a week I can grow, and I want to grow. I'm selfish and self-centered. I want this program for me because I want to feel good. And I started going to four and five Al-Anon meetings a week, and I still do that today. And I go to one AA speaker meeting a week, too, because, you see, I have to keep going to reinforce my thinking that I don't live with the only crazy son of a gun around. <laughs> now, and going to those AA speaker meetings gave me gratitude. They taught me how to laugh because, you see, everything was devastating to me. And the alcoholics taught me how to laugh. al taught me how to live. And I started going to my meetings. I was told to get a sponsor right away, and I did, and I believe in strong sponsorship. You know, and Billy talked about people giving him advice. You bet I want people to give me advice because, you see, my best ideas got me here. You can call them strong suggestions if you want to, but my sponsor gives me advice, and I'm glad she does that. You see, she cares about my life. She cares about me enough to tell me what to do when I don't know what to do. I need someone giving me direction in order to walk forwards. And she got me into those steps. And she told me, I went, and, and I was so hostile, I didn't want anybody hugging on me. And I told her one night, I said, why do they do that to me? She says, because they want you to keep coming back. And I said, well, can't they just say it? <laughs> you know. And she goes, no, they have to hug you, because when they put their arms around yours and yours follows them, then God embraces you both in the fellowship of this program. And I thought, God, nobody had ever talked to me like that before. Nobody ever cared. And after a while, I got to feeling good doing that, and I was hugging people, and I got eight assignments. I had to give eight hugs at every meeting I went to. <laughs> and then I got to the point that I didn't know how many hugs I got. And I told her one night, I said, God, I feel good in here. I enjoy coming to my meetings now, but I don't feel like this at home. How do I feel like this at home? 
She said, if you're not taking this program home, you don't have a program. You got to take it home. You got to do the things at home that you're doing in these meetings because we don't care if you're wonderful in your meetings. You got to take it home. And I said, how do I do that? She said, you go home and you hug on them. I said, I don't want to do that. She goes, we don't care. <laughs> she said, in fact, tonight you're going to go home and you're going to give Keith a big hug and, and you're going to call me tomorrow morning and you're going to tell me you did it. And I thought, okay. Yeah, because I didn't debate with this lady. I mean, I didn't know what to do. And I had faith and trust in her. And today I know that I found my God through people, that my God works through people. And if I will just place my faith and confidence in this program, that God works through you to get to me. And so I said, okay, and I followed that advice. And I got home, and here Keith came toward me, and I thought, oh, no. And he walked up beside me, and I put my arm around him and hugged me, and he goes, what's that for? And I said, just for the hell of it. They made me do it. Don't ask me why. <laughs> And I started doing that. And I started doing it with Simone. It's like her and I had to change schedules. I had to get up earlier in the morning because I had to get in the bathroom before she did because her and I fought in the bathrooms all the time. And I get up in the morning and I get ready and then I go kiss her goodbye and, and I go on to work. And I'll never forget the morning she called me and she goes, Mom, are you mad at me? And I said, No, why? She said, Because every morning when I get up and I look in the mirror to brush my teeth. I always see your, your lipstick print on my face, and I know you care. And I thought, God, it's working. It's working. Because, you see, it's only the actions that we take that changes our thinking. I had to start acting like I cared before I could feel like I cared. And I didn't know what love was. I didn't know if I loved Keith or not. And my sponsor said, you just hang in. You know, you're the kind of person that's going to have a man in your life. And she said 90% of the al Anons that get divorces end up with another drunk, so you might as well practice on the one you got. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember going to a convention in Canada when we were a year and a half in the program. And I remember a lady that, that you all probably know by the name of Arbutus from Texas. And I heard her share about the feelings of the alcoholic compared to the feelings of the al -Anon. And there was no difference. And I heard her say that the only difference between an alcoholic and an al -Anon is the obsession. His is the booze and ours is the boozer. And I accepted that. And we got on a plane to come home from that convention. And Keith took a hold of my hand and I trembled inside. And I knew I loved that man like a woman loves a man. Because, you see, I don't believe I could fall in love with a man in my life until I found compassion for the alcoholic. Because, you see, the man in my life is an alcoholic. And I believe that I had to start working on me and my feelings in order to have feelings in that home. And I've only found those feelings in my life through the 12 steps of this program. Because, you see, those 12 steps have showed me who I am. I was taught to do that inventory that Billy didn't want to do through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the four-column method. It's real easy to take everybody else's inventory, but it's really hard for me to look at me. The blueprint for progress didn't do a thing for me. I said yes, no, and maybe. <laughs> and when I couldn't be honest, my sponsor said, you're going to do the one in the big book of AA, and I'm so grateful for that. Because when I got to the fourth column, I had to look at me. What part did I play in that? My first one was the violence. Keith was the resentment and the cause was the violence. And he was always the one beating up on me. And I had to look at that. How did it make me feel? Less than, like a nobody, like it didn't count. And then I got to go to my second resentment. It was God. He didn't answer my prayers, I thought. He didn't pay any attention to me. What was the third column? It made me feel less than and like a nobody and like I didn't count. And then I got to go through all of my resentments that way and get back to that fourth column and say, How do, what part did I play? And I got to relive all those things because, you see, I'd taken the third step 
And I got to ask my God to put the words in the pencil that I needed to see on the paper. And I got to see that. And I got to see and relive the part where I could see myself getting in his face. I asked for that. I forced myself on another human being till they couldn't stand me and they did the things to me to get them out of their face. That's why I know I have to work a program today because I will return to that. I wasn't afraid to get in a drunk's face. That's the kind of person I am. And in a resentment with God, the fourth column, I wanted what I wanted when I wanted it, and enough was never enough. I was telling God what to do. And I got to go through all of that, and I got through with that, and my God. And I told my sponsor, I'm such a horrible person. She says, no, you're not. You're a sick person that wants to get well. And this program will get you into healthy living. If you will look at the sixth and the seventh step, and in the AA 12 and 12, it talks about that's the steps that separate the men from the boys. And I see a lot of people that stop at the fifth step because I've done it. And they go on to the twelfth step. But when I got to the sixth step, I got to really see me. I got to recognize those character defects. And my sponsor said, that's who you really are. To do the seventh step, you give that person to God. You don't work on trying to change that person. If you work on your character defects, you will become negative. You give the character defects to your God to work on, and you work on the positive side. And that's the way you become positive. I'm selfish and self-centered. This program is mine, and it comes before anything else or anybody else. I'm greedy. I want it all, and I want it right now. So I go to a lot of meetings because I'm also impatient. I want everything you have. And I'm trying to turn those character defects into assets in my life by living a program way of life. And I've gotten to make my amends. And the freedom behind that's unreal. Because the freedom behind that is finding me and just getting to be me because that's who I am. I don't have to walk around every day being sorry anymore. Because I try to be the very best Al-Anon I can be on a daily basis. That's my amends most of the time. Some of my amends was just staying the hell out of everybody's life and concentrating on me and being into my morning meditation, taking the, the 11th step. And then after I take those 11 steps, then it's time to get into the 12th step and not a minute too soon. I can't have a spiritual awakening until I've done the first 11 because there haven't been any changes yet. And once I felt that spiritual awakening that I was somebody, people would come up to me and say, Sue, you're so loving. God, it used to overwhelm me. still does sometimes because that's not who I really am because you don't know how I feel in here sometimes. You don't know that on any given day I wake up angry for no reason at all. And then when I get into my morning meditation and I talk to my God, it calms down. The calmness comes. And then I can be an instrument of my higher power and carry this message everywhere I go and be who I am everywhere I'm at and not be ashamed of who I am anymore. Because, you see, I look in the mirror every morning like I was taught to in the beginning and say, Good morning, Sue, I love you. And I was taught to do those things. Our life started getting better because we was taught to work the traditions in our home, to become a unit. Personal progress is a person, gives us unity in the home, and to bring those traditions in our home to live there. And before I quit sharing, I have to tell you that this program is real. Life is real. And we had to find out that this program doesn't fix people. It gives me the tools to fix myself, and they're available here for me. And that this program has taught me that I love an alcoholic, and that I'm grateful that I have an alcoholic in my life today, or I wouldn't have you if I didn't have an alcoholic in my life. And our life was fine, and we were wonderful and doing all the service and everything that we were supposed to do. And then I've heard around here that between... Nine and 11 years, there has to be big surrenders in order for there to be long-term program. And we got to go through some of those surrenders. And they were scary. 
In about February of 85, I got real scared. Because the big book of AA talks about that the alcoholic ego will revive itself. And I saw that alcoholic ego. I didn't see it in me. I didn't know I was on an ego trip and I was in the same place. We were Mr. AA and Miss Alanon walking around. We were wonderful. <laughs> but I could see it in the alcoholic because, you see, I, I get my eyes on him, especially when it's not going good. Yeah because that's who I am. And I saw Keith's ego flourishing, and I became scared, because I knew that if that alcoholic ego wasn't smashed, the only thing that came next was drunkenness. God, I don't want drunkenness to return to my home. And I went to my sponsor, and she said, you will get back to the basics. You do it one day at a time. You won't run. You've been an emotional runner all your life. You're going to take this thing one day at a time. God in AA knows what to do with that man and not you. And I lived for the next, until through May, one day at a time. Scared, scared that that alcoholic was going to drink. And you see, I knew the whole time I was in that fear that it was none of my business. It's none of my business if he ever takes another drink. But the feelings were there. And I had to work a stronger program for me to keep my eyes off of him. And in May of 1985, he came home one day and he said he had been fired from a job that he'd had for 18 and a half years. And I said, my God, how did that happen? And he said, because I got served with a federal subpoena today at work for being involved with organized crime over 20 years and they've called me in. God, I got angry. My God, you're not supposed to be living that way. You're sober in AA. You can't do those things. And the anger came up, and the faith went down. And I went to my sponsor's house, and I said, AA is not working. It has failed me. She said, it has worked. He's not drunk. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, he wasn't doing it my way and in my time. And today's page talked about that, thank God. And I, I resented it. And I walked into her house, and her husband, that's sober at AA, started to hug me, and I said, Leave me alone. You're an alcoholic. <laughs> and I said, AA doesn't work. And my sponsor sat there, and she loved on me, and she talked to me, and she said, Sue, everything in your life has to fail you in order for you to get closer to your God. She said, The alcoholic failed you in order for you to get to al -Anon. She said, there's been times that you thought sponsors have failed you, and they have not. There's been times that you thought Al-Anon had failed you, and it had not. And now you think that AA has failed you, and it has not. This is only a surrender. That there are expectations that you have had that things are going to make it better for you, and it's not true. The only thing that can make it better for you is you and your relationship with your God one more time. And that you can't have expectations of other human beings, no matter who they are, how wonderful you think they are. She said, you turn that man over one more time to his God and Alcoholics Anonymous and let them work on him and take care of him, and you stay active in this program. And it was during that time that I was elected chairman of the Southern California al Convention. My God knew what I needed, because you see, it's only the actions that I take that get me more into recovery. And I got to be grateful on a daily basis for physical sobriety. I go to bed at night. My sponsor told me to call this lady because Keith was listening to a tape on a regular basis going through all of that. By a name, a man by the name of Norma. And my sponsor said, you call his wife. And Norma had been dead for two or three years at that point. And it's like, God, this guy's 12-stepping my husband from the grave. And I thought, i got to talk to Betty because they've been through those surrenders. She's got to have something to share with me. And I called her and I told her the things that were happening in our life. And she said, Sue, you can't do anything with Keith. She said, you can't do anything about his sobriety. It's none of your business if he ever drinks again. What you have to do is support him the way a woman supports a man. She said, he's going to lose his dignity in a lot of areas. 
when he goes in that courtroom, when he doesn't have a job, he's going to have to look at himself enough. Don't you lay any guilt trips on him. Don't you judge him. You just tell him I love you. And you support him in the bedroom the way a woman supports a man. Don't let him lose it in that bedroom. He's got to keep his dignity somewhere. And I made that commitment to that lady. And there's many times we go to bed at night and Keith would reject me. But I had enough time in this program that I didn't take it personal. You see, I knew he was in a bad place and I knew it wasn't me. And that I allowed him to have his bad days. And there were days that were good. And I, there was days that I had good days no matter what place he was in. And it's like, God, it works. I'm having a good day and he's in a bad place. Yeah, and it felt so good because I didn't have to get up any morning and anymore and say, how are we this morning? (laughs) And we got to walk through that. And I allowed him to have his bad days and his feelings. And I'd go to bed at night and I'd lay down beside him and I'd say, thank you for another sober day in our home because I couldn't see how an alcoholic was getting through that without drinking. Because, you see, I've accepted that normal for an alcoholic is drunk. And so I got grateful for physical sobriety, and that was enough. And we got through that. I didn't have to look for him a job, and I worked for an employment agency at that time. That's a miracle in itself. Uh, (laughs) I, I allowed him the dignity of not having to work. And not laying guilt trips on him, not judging him, because you see, sobriety was the most important thing that was going on in our home that day. Because you see, I love an alcoholic. And the only thing I could do was go to my meetings, and God, I'm so grateful for the girls that I sponsored. There were some of them that had to walk away from me because I told you my ego was building. But when that surrender hit, we weren't wonderful anymore. We were real. And my sponsor told me, you go on your meetings and you share exactly what you feel today. And when I became less than wonderful in those meetings again, there were people that had to walk away from me. And it hurt. And it was painful. But they taught me something. They taught me that there's no pedestals in this program. There's love and there's loyalty and there's people that are human beings. And I got to be returned to humanness. That's all I am, is just another human being. I called a lady one day that's been in this program forever. And I said, my God, have you ever been standing on one side of the street and the sun's shining and it's a good day and you feel lonely and everybody else is over here and it's sunny over there too and they're having fun? Because this seems to be like it's a social club for them. But they're over there and they're having fun and they're socializing and you're over here and you're trudging and you're working the steps and you're alone. She says, welcome to long-term program. (laughs) Because making a social club out of this thing is just a a short-term fix for a permanent pain. That you got to get into these steps and you got to live it. You can't talk it. You gotta live it. It's a program of living. God, I'm so grateful for the teachings that I was given because if I hadn't gotten it that way, I wouldn't have been able to get through that period of time. And it was hard. And my God was there with me. What I got to learn is that there's a difference between having faith in your God and trusting your God. I was totally powerless. I mean, The jury wasn't going to listen to me. They didn't even ask me to be a witness, thank God. (laughs) And I know today the reason I got to go through that kind of surrender is because a few weeks ago a girl called me and she said, my husband is sober. He's an international dope dealer, sober. (laughs) And he's got to go back and forth between L.A. and Singapore. And I'm a travel agent. What do I do? And I said, you hand him the yellow pages. That's what you do. 
And she said, how did you handle it when you found out Keith was involved with organized crime? And I said, I knew it was his problem and not mine. And I didn't pay any attention to it. Because, you see, it was his price to pay and not mine. And I got to hear him come home one day and say, babe, they let me go. I'm a free man. And I said, that's wonderful. I used to think you as a free man when you got into AA, but I guess you were just loose. Today he's free. <laughs> and I'm grateful for the things that you've given me and that you've taught me. Simone and I have a wonderful relationship today. Her and I went through a lot of surrenders. I love her a lot today, and I know she loves me. She went to the program of Alateen until she was about 20 years old. She has a way of life that is unreal. Her program, she went from Alateen into Al-Anon, and her program gave her the ability to have faith in herself and to have courage and to have dignity, and she chose to be a mop. And she lives in Milan, Italy today, and she's an international model over there because she loves herself. She's getting to follow a dream and do the things that she's always wanted to do. And the miracle of that is that the program of Alateen and Al-Anon gave her the courage to follow a dream and to become somebody she always wanted to be. Before she went over there, she said, Mom, I've got to try it. She said, because I don't want to be 35 years old and a bunch of kids sitting around my feet and me sitting in a rocking chair wondering if I could have. Yeah, and I said, good for you. Yeah. And she gets to do that today. And she's home on vacation right now. And we've been able to hug on her. And we've been able to give her the freedom the last three weeks since she's been home. I mean, it's like she's really not home in the last three weeks because she brought her Italian boyfriend home with her. And she has to entertain him while he's over here because he doesn't know where he's at and he doesn't know how to speak English and he's like a fish out of water. <laughs> and so we give her the freedom to do the things with him to show him America and to be with him. And then when he's going to be gone next week, then we can spend the time with her. You see, we don't have to smother her with our love anymore. We give her the freedom to do and be whoever she's got to be. And I love Fabio, her boyfriend, today because I know he loves her. He's a nice gentleman, and he's good to her. And he doesn't speak English, so I just treat him like a drunk. They don't understand what you say either. <laughs> We was trying to teach him the other day to say Coke because he wanted to order a Coke in a restaurant and he'd go, Coke. <laughs> and it just sounded like he was grunting. And Simone said, you know, it's he has the hardest time at restaurants. And I said, well, tell him to say Pepsi. And I looked at him and I said, say Pepsi. And we couldn't understand Pepsi either. So I said, say Dr. Pepper. And he was able to say that pretty good. And I said, good. Then say Dr. Pepper. She goes, Mommy doesn't like Dr. Pepper. <laughs> and I said, I know. But when he says Dr. Pepper, most places don't have it, and they'll say, well, we only have Coke, and then all he's got to say is, okay. Yeah. Just... <laughs> I mean, you guys have taught me how to get around to the positive, you know. <laughs> And there's days you just got to work your way around to it, you know. And it's like, it's fun. You know, our life's fun today. We have a lot of people in our life, you know. And we get to sponsor a lot of young people. And I love the enthusiasm of the young people in this program. It seems like they're coming in younger and younger all the time, and I love them. I love sponsoring young al -Anons. And the basic reason I love sponsoring young al -Anons is because every time I get to hear a fifth step with them, I get to hear my daughter. And it gives me the gratitude that I don't have to be the kind of mother that I used to be. And that these girls teach me how to love unconditionally. And when I learn how to love unconditionally with them, then I can give it back to Simone. Exactly the way it's supposed to be. And you people have taught me how to love a drunk, how not to have expectations. You've taught me to love myself. When I was new in this program, I heard a man called Chuck C. And he said, what if you woke up one morning and you found out you were who you always wanted to be? Could you handle it? And I thought, not me. 
Today I woke up that lady because you gave her to me. I looked in the mirror and her and I winked at each other and I blew her a kiss because she's a neat lady today. She's number one in my life because I love her a lot and she loves me back. There's no expectations. There's no rights and there's no wrongs. It's just the way it is. Because you see, I can feel that way today about me because you gave me a God of my understanding. Because I believe that my God works through people and you were always there for me. And my God works through people today. And it's like this story of this little boy that it was thunder and lightning outside and he was afraid. And he ran in and he got in bed with his mom and dad. And he was crying. And his dad said, what's wrong with you? And he said, I'm afraid. And his dad said, you don't have to be afraid. God was in there with you. And he said, I know. But right now I need something with skin on it. (laughs) (laughs) And that's what you are to me. You're my skin on it. And you've always been there for me, whether I've been right or wrong. Your loyalty and your love and your faithful to me has taught me loyalty and love and faith and trust in my higher power. I would have never gotten it the other way. And today, because of everything you can give me, I can stand here and say I am who I am, and I know you love me no matter what. And because I am that person today, I love an alcoholic. And that's what this program is designed to do. It gives us the ability to look at that person that we used to say, my God, why is he doing that for? You've given the ability to look at him today and say, ain't he cute? He's doing exactly what an alcoholic is supposed to be doing. And I get to look at him with eyes of love instead of eyes of hatred. And I feel love for that man no matter what. Because you see, I realized a couple months ago, I looked at him one day, And I thought, my God, I have no expectations of him whatsoever. You see, I know I couldn't have those feelings without the surrenders that have gone on in our home. He's real. And that's who he gets to be today. Because you've let me be real. I am who you wanted me to be. And you're who I want you to be because I love you a whole bunch. Thank you for being there for me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.